Greetings uh, and welcome back. Uh, when I left you last time, I was talking about the Supreme Court and I was talking about decisions and opinions. Remember, this occurs in the judicial conference after the oral arguments are heard. Remember, the decision is nothing more than who won and who lost in a case. So uh, you might have a, a nine to zero opinion. Okay, so you know which side won and which side lost. Uh, or in a five to four, you know which side won and which side lost. Uh, with the opinions, uh, here is where the Supreme Court justices are explaining, here is why we believe the law is uh, what it is. Uh, and so if you look at your notes, you will see several words. Uh, and uh, what these words basically denote is how many justices are involved. So uh, in this case, I'm assuming that all nine justices uh, are voting in a case. That's not always true. Uh, sometimes a judge uh, excuses himself. For example, Thurgood Marshall did uh, in the Ali case. Uh, Justice Breyer uh, often would excuse himself uh, from cases because at one time he was a very successful corporate attorney. And if one of his former clients is petitioning the Supreme Court or is defending himself in the Supreme Court, he has an obvious conflict of interest. So the, the strongest opinion that a court can give is a uh, unanimous opinion, right? And in a unanimous opinion, that means that all of the judges agree uh, with the legal reasoning. Once again, remember that in all opinions, if the chief justice is on the winning side, he controls the opinion of the court. And uh, chief justices have taken very different views uh, in terms of whether to write the opinion themselves or, or whether to give the opinion uh, to a colleague. So, for example, you may remember I talked about uh, John Marshall earlier, remember in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. During the 34 years Chief Justice Marshall was the Chief Justice, he wrote every important decision uh, of his uh, uh, opinion of his court. Uh, he did not assign away uh, important opinions. There are other Supreme Court justices, uh, uh, Chief Justice Warren, for example, uh, would often uh, give away opinions. You may remember me speaking earlier uh, in uh, the course talking about the landmark case of Gideon versus Wainwright, where uh, the state of Florida had deprived Clarence Earl Gideon uh, of legal counsel. Uh, even though the Chief Justice uh, Warren was on the winning side, uh, he knew that for 21 years, Justice Hugo Black the number one issue for him was trying to get legal counsel for the poor. So uh, uh, as a, uh, an honor, uh, he, he gave that honor of writing that opinion in Gideon versus Wainwright uh, to his colleague, Hugo Black. So uh, when your book talks about uh, Supreme Court chief justices controlling the opinion of the court and your textbook uses that same language, do not assume that that always means that they write that opinion. They certainly can choose to, but they can delegate it to another colleague. Obviously, if the Chief Justice is on the losing side, uh, he doesn't control the opinion of the court. Uh, in that case, the senior member uh, of the winning side uh, would control the opinion of the court. Now, if you scroll down in your notes or if you have printed out a copy, uh, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, a unanimous opinion uh, is the strongest opinion of the court. Because in that case, with a unanimous opinion, not only do all nine judges agree on who won, but they also all agree on why they won. So in this case, the law is very settled. Uh, if you're on the losing side, uh, you're not likely to bring uh, another opinion uh, like that for a while. Uh, the next strongest opinion that the Supreme Court can deliver is a majority opinion. Remember the word major majority always means at least 50% plus one. So the minimum number of justices that would be required for a majority opinion would be five. Uh, it could be uh, as many as eight. 
Uh, obviously, once it's all nine, it's no longer a majority opinion. Uh, it is then a unanimous opinion. Uh, generally, and there are exceptions to this, but not very many, generally the weakest opinion of a court uh, is that next opinion, the plurality opinion. Uh, plurality, that means that uh, it's the most popular opinion of the winning side, but it's less than a majority. So a plurality opinion uh, could be as few as two. Uh, it could be as many as four. Uh, an example of that would be a case we're going to talk about later in the uh, course. Uh, the uh, case was called uh, Barnes versus Glenn Theater. The Supreme Court decision was five to four. The Supreme Court, by a five to four margin, ruled that Indiana could ban nude dancing. So five people agreed on who should win, but the five winners had three very different reasons for why they thought Indiana should be allowed to ban nude dancing. So the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist in this case, along with two other justices, signed a plurality opinion. And essentially what they said is we believe that both sides have a valid constitutional claim. However, we believe that in this particular case, uh, Indiana's claim of protecting basic standards of decency and public morality through their indecency statutes is a stronger argument than the First Amendment claim that is being made by the dancers. So both sides are valid claims and we recognize that. We do believe that nude dancing is entitled to First Amendment protection on the outer perimeter of the First Amendment, but in this case we're ruling with Indiana. Now, two of the winners disagreed with that reason. They agreed with the decision, that is, that Indiana should win, but they did not agree with this balancing test. Uh, and I'll just give you one of the concurring opinions, right? And if you look below in your notes, you will see that a concurring opinion is where a justice agrees with the decision. In other words, yes, we agree the right side won in this case, but I would rule this case very differently. The legal reasoning that I would employ is significantly different than being employed by my colleagues. So let me just give you one example in Barnes versus Glenn Theater of a concurring opinion. So Justice Scalia said that I would use very different reasoning because I disagree with Rehnquist. I do not believe that both sides have a valid constitutional claim. I believe that only Indiana does. Our court on numerous occasions has ruled that for there to be speech, there must be the conveyance of an idea that is understood by a normal or average person in the community. In this case, what is being expressed by this expressive activity, which is what the court called dancing? We do not believe, I do not believe that there is a, a coherent message and therefore, Indiana is the only side with a valid claim. Uh, they do have the right to protect basic standards of decency and public morality, and they are attempting to do that through their indecency statutes. So you see how that's different? Uh, in this case, you have two justices, Chief Justice Rehnquist and two colleagues who say, we believe that both sides have a valid constitutional claim, but Indiana's is stronger. Scalia is rejecting that. Scalia is saying that is not true. Both sides do not have a valid claim. Only the state of Indiana does. So in that case, that would be a concurring opinion where he is agreeing with the decision, but he would employ different legal reasoning for the decision. Uh, the last of the opinions that is in your notes uh, are the dissenting opinions. And, and frankly, for me, the dissenting opinions uh, are the most fun uh, because they are not written within the constructs of the law. Now, in many cases, the dissents are written very legalistically, uh, but they don't have to. Uh, and sometimes uh, dissenting opinions can be incredibly powerful social commentaries. And I'll give you an example uh, that is not in your notes, but I'll refer to this case later. Uh, my favorite dissent of all time was Justice Harlan's dissent uh, in the famous or infamous 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson. 
The decision of the court in Plessy versus Ferguson was eight to one. So Justice Harlan is the lone dissenter. All of his colleagues are against him. And in that famous case, what the majority ruled uh, is that uh, Louisiana could segregate people in trains or rail cars uh, by race. In other words, Louisiana could put white passengers uh, in white rail cars and so-called colored passengers in colored rail cars. And the majority said that this was a legitimate exercise of the state's police powers. And, and Justice Harlan uh, had a stirring dissent in this case. Uh, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, he said that at one time the Constitution acknowledged a superior ruling class and an inferior serving class. And I was part of that system. You see, Justice Harlan had grown up in a slave-owning family in Kentucky. He went on to say, but we fought a great civil war, and today the Constitution is intended to be colorblind and no longer acknowledge distinctions between its citizens. And so he went on after drawing this distinction that, you know, yeah, the Constitution originally acknowledged the great evil uh, of slavery, uh, but that's over. Uh, and now uh, all of us are entitled to equal treatment under the law. Now, it took a long time for the Supreme Court to right this wrong. The so-called separate but equal doctrine that was the result of Plessy versus Ferguson was the law of the land as a legal principle for 58 years until the famous case of Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Uh, that case where unanimously, nine to zero, the Supreme Court ruled that in this case, public segregation was illegal and that schools must be desegregated, quote, with all deliberate speed. And, and so Brown validated that dissent from Justice Harlan. But for 58 years, Justice Harlan uh, was uh, essentially a, a call uh, to the future, a, a call to right this great wrong. Uh, and in this case, of course, eventually uh, this did occur. So dissents can become the later legal reasoning for a decision. And let me give you one other example uh, in this case, I'll give you my second favorite dissent of all time. It was in a 1942 case called Betts versus Brady. Uh, in Betts versus Brady, the Supreme Court ruled, in essence, that that lawyers were luxuries. Uh, and so, uh, what this essentially meant was, uh, we, the Supreme Court, are going to allow you, the states, to determine whether you give legal counsel to the poor or not. Uh, and so virtually all Western states, including our state, the state of California, uh, gave legal counsel to the poor. Uh, but most Southern states did not. Uh, most Southern states uh, accepted the argument that lawyers were luxuries. And so Florida did not provide legal counsel for the poor. And, uh, and, and so 21 years after Betts versus Brady, we get the landmark case of Gideon versus Wainwright. Uh, and once again, the Supreme Court, using the logic of Justice Black's dissent in 1942, in 1963, they reversed that earlier precedent uh, and said that all states are under an obligation under the Sixth Amendment to provide legal counsel for the poor. When Justice Black left the Supreme Court building, a reporter yelled out, Justice Black, isn't it? Isn't it great to be on the right side this time? And Justice Black looked at the reporter and said, I was on the right side in 1942. It just took my colleagues on the court a couple of decades to get caught up with me. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about judicial review and the most important Supreme Court case in American history, the case of Marbury versus Madison.